Boy, those freeways sure are crowded. How do we relieve congestion on the freeways? Well, stop carrying the cargo on the trucks. Hello everybody, I am Nick the Naval Architect, and today we're going to talk about short sea shipping. This is an answer to the question of how to relieve congestion on the freeways. We want to shift some of that cargo from being carried on land by trucks to instead carry it on sea in river and coastal routes. We call this short sea shipping, and it is a dream that has inspired many naval architects to come up with innovative concepts, and I'm no different. So today we're going to introduce the DMS Shore Hopper. It's a vessel concept that's designed to travel along coastlines and waterways all across the US and even beyond. This can work along any major riverway in the world, and the goal is to provide an economic means to transport container cargo across short distances. So why are there all concepts but no success stories? Well, in my opinion, it comes down to the problem of infrastructure. So much cargo travels by intermodal container, ISO containers. All of those ISO containers get loaded onto a container ship, they travel across the ocean, and they're very efficiently transported to your front door. Except that that journey for the ISO container requires more than just a container ship. Once the container ship arrives in port, we rely on a vast network of infrastructure to shift the container from one mode of transport to the other. And one of the biggest components is the container terminal. It's a massive complex filled with expensive cranes to unload the ships, reach stackers to move and stack the containers, rail yards, truck depots, and weighing scales, all to handle this massive industrial complex for moving containers around. And this is the problem with short sea shipping. If you're going to take those containers, put them on another ship, and transport them along some short route, you need a way to bring them on and off of the ship. And if we want that ship traveling up and down the coast, delivering to small towns along the way, then we need to create all of that infrastructure at every delivery point. Well, that's ridiculous! It costs millions to develop a full containers terminal. Even at small sizes, we still need all of the equipment. No tiny American town can afford to develop all of that infrastructure. So instead, we need to bring the infrastructure to them. The Shorehopper was intentionally designed for minimal infrastructure. It brings its own equipment to load and unload containers. We have a reach stacker on board, ready to stack those containers onto nearby trucks. We don't even need a deep channel or deep port to dock this vessel. The vessel can easily nestle up against shallow riverbanks to unload. The only infrastructure required is a riverbank with a slope of 8 degrees and a concrete pad for the ramp to touch down on. Well, that's actually pretty easy. What I've just described is a boat ramp for launching recreational boats. Nearly every small town in America has one of those, or can afford the minor investment to build one. If you can launch a fishing dinghy, we can use the same spot to unload cargo. That is the only infrastructure that the Shorehopper needs. Okay, let's take a look at this beauty. The table on the screen lists the major vessel particulars, and with a length to beam ratio of 3.4, the Shorehopper is no slim duck. This behaves more like a barge. She has a wide hull with a shallow draft, which allows us to carry plenty of cargo on deck. But unlike a dumb barge, the Shorehopper includes a pointed bow, a curved hull, it is a true ship, complete with its own propulsion. This grants us to the grace to handle moderate waves and coastal waters. We don't need to hide in rivers when a storm comes along, but when it comes to delivery time, rivers remain an option. At 68 meters long, the Shorehopper is slightly longer than a typical Mississippi barge and that river regularly carries trains of barges rafted together that are nearly 300 meters long. And don't worry about those tight river turns. With twin propellers, twin rudders, and a stern thruster, the Shorehopper can easily handle rivers. Now talk about range! 
the Shorehopper can go the distance. With a range of 3,500 nautical miles, at that distance we can travel the Atlantic coast of the United States three times before refueling. This even enables us to cross the Atlantic Ocean. Very handy for delivering the vessel from a foreign shipyard. Now, as a barge hull form, the Shorehopper does require a lot of power to push through the water at 14 knots. The figure on your screen shows the estimated power curve. And yeah, it's pretty steep. We need over 2,000 kilowatts to travel at 14 knots. Not the most fuel efficient. But here lurks a hidden chance for new advantages. Look at that graph. If you drop your speed to just 12 knots, we cut the power requirement in half. That drastically increases your ship range between refueling. You get the choice. You can choose between a faster delivery time or better fuel efficiency. The Shorehopper appeals to either strategy. Okay, let's highlight a few unique features, some major items that make this vessel really interesting. First up is the stern ramp. Initially, we designed the Shorehopper as a landing craft, and all landing craft suffer from a major conflict the bow ramp. To unload cargo, we want this wide ramp at the bow that's close to the water. But that doesn't work when you're trying to fight through ocean waves. Against those waves, we want a narrow pointed bow with very high sides. Well, try to combine a wide bow ramp with a narrow bow, and you just get disappointment all around. So, DMS eliminated the conflict we moved the ramp to the stern. Now we have a conventional pointed bow that's perfectly designed for ocean waves. And the stern ramp stretches the entire width of the ship, allowing for very easy unloading. The benefits of this extend below the waterline too. If we can slope the bottom of the ship up, that lets us get closer to the shore, which minimizes the size of the stern ramp, which you really want the stern ramp to be as short as possible. Now, by happy coincidence, that upward slope falls pretty close to the ideal hydrodynamic shape for the stern of a ship. So that gentle sloping stern makes for lower water resistance and lower fuel consumption while also helping us to land against river banks. Another conflict eliminated. But there is a catch. You see, the stern ramp requires us to dock the vessel in reverse. The ship will first pull perpendicular to a dock and then reverse its way in. Normally, that's a challenging task, but the shower hopper employs a few tricks to make this easier, starting with retractable rudders. The ship uses twin rudders for conventional steering when it's moving forward. These stick down below the hull, which is great for maneuvering, but it's a disaster when you're trying to back that into a shoreline. So to avoid any damage, the rudders pivot up into the hull before we start reversing. Sounds pretty complicated, huh? Well, it's not so bad. We don't even need to invent new technology to achieve this. We can borrow from a similar industry. Cruise ships use a device called an active stabilizer fin. It sticks out from the side of the hull horizontally, and they use it to reduce roll motion. It's basically a rudder turned sideways. But when that same cruise ship comes into dock, the stabilizer fin pivots back inside the hull. So now you take that same device and turn it vertical. The stabilizer fin now acts like a rudder. Sure, we need to adjust some of the programming to make it behave like a rudder, but the machinery for this already exists. We have already solved this problem and just need to use the solution in a slightly different way. Now I know you're thinking about that docking operation. If the rudder is retracted, the ship does lose some maneuverability. We still rely on twin propellers, which offer a lot of control, but we also supplement that with an azimuthing stern thruster. That will help you control the stern while you're reversing in. And this thruster stays flush against the bottom of the hull. It's just a small grate along the bottom, but it can be pointed in any direction to help control that stern. Perfect for backing into the riverbank. Now you heard me say twin propellers, and you're probably worried that we're going to hit the riverbank with them. Nope, because those propellers, they are sitting at the bow, not the stern. Yes, the propellers, they always require a compromise on most landing craft. 
our primary fear focuses around damaging those propellers, bending or breaking them on the river bottom as we're approaching shore. And that fear drives designers to recess the propellers, hide them up in tunnels. That is a horrible place to put a propeller. Sticking the propeller inside a tunnel really fights a lot of its design and sucks at its efficiency. And there's no guarantee that those propellers won't still suck up silt and gravel. Not a really good solution. DMS avoided this whole problem by moving the propellers from the stern to the bow. Even when the stern touches against the shoreline, the propellers are sitting over 50 meters away on the other end. They're sitting safe in open, clear water. And even when you're in normal transit, that hull does protect the propellers. They're sitting halfway in tunnels at the bow, but the front of the propellers is fully exposed to open water flow due to the shape of the bow. So it allows a good compromise of efficient water flow into the propeller, but the hull is still there to protect you from any large debris. And anything like a log or a submerged car is going to get deflected by the ship's hull before it ever endangers the propellers. Now, I know, bow propellers seem really odd. Some of you might think that this can't work. Won't the wash from the propellers push back against the hull, negating any thrust? Well, not really, because that's not how propellers work. Oversimplifying the physics, a propeller works in two halves. It creates a region of lower pressure on the forward end of the propeller that pulls the propeller forward and the ship along with it. Half of our thrust comes from that suction region. The other half comes from a region of high pressure aft of the propeller. That one is pushing instead of pulling. Every propeller generates this combination of suction at the front and high pressure at the back. So think about these two pressure regions and apply that to a conventional ship that puts its propellers at the stern. Even at the stern, we still have to deal with interactions between those pressure regions in the hull. In the case of the stern application, the low pressure at the front also pulls backwards against the hull. It's fighting the hull's forward motion. And that does actually reduce the effect of thrust by around 10% or less. We call that our thrust deduction. We know about this drawback and adjust for it when we're designing the hull and the propeller. Naval architecture has already solved that problem decades ago. And this is good news for us because it's the same issue when we put the propeller at the bow. It's just now that we're interacting with the high pressure side. But again, nothing novel. It's a problem already solved. Want to make some money? Yes, economics matter with any ship. This is a business tool. It needs to be profitable. And that's why DMS ran a preliminary economic analysis right from the beginning. Now, it's really hard to get a good cost estimate without a full design. But taking a stab in the dark, we estimate this ship will cost about $46 million to build, U.S. dollars. And over a 30-year lifetime, it's going to generate about $223 million in income. That estimate is going to fluctuate wildly depending on your current freight rates and your cargo that you're carrying. You combine the build costs with the running costs and the income, take all of that, feed it into a discounted cash flow model, and we've estimated that the ship will generate a net present value of $35 million over its lifetime. Yes, that is $35 million. That's a pretty good return on investment. I don't know about you, but I would be very happy if I came out $35 million richer. Let's wrap it all up now. Most ships require some form of compromise, but the shorehopper is not most ships. We have happily removed many of those design conflicts. The best advantage is that it requires minimal infrastructure to operate. We just need a boat ramp to unload our cargo. The ship can move equally well on shallow rivers or coastal waters, and she delivers very good return on investment. It is a profitable ship concept that fits a market niche while relieving congestion on freeways. That sounds really interesting to me. Pretty cool, huh? This is neat, fascinating science of ship design. But why should this big science only be available to big ships? Smaller operators deserve to have your vessel operating at peak efficiency 
and delivering the best return possible for you. So check out the website and let's see how we can take your big ideas and make them into reality, no matter the size of your vessel. Thanks.